This is Joshua English for the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. If you frame restraint as a treatment, it has an indication, it has contraindications, it has side effects, and it has dosages for all intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. And that could be some verbal judo all the way up to four-point leather restraints for the spit. In this episode, we continue our series on ethics and EMS, specifically ethics and restraints. I'm in conversation with Mike Tagman, General Manager of AMR Alameda County, Patrick Lickis, Clinical and Educational Specialist for AMR in Alameda County, and Elsie Cusel, the Field Training Coordinator for AMR in Alameda County. Here's Mike Tagman. You know, one of the, the first questions that always comes up is, you know, why why do we ever need to restrain a patient? Kind of what's the purpose? And I think that, that it's it's really important to keep in mind and sometimes in the in the heat of a tense situation it's easy to forget. The the reason we restrain is for protection. And it's for protection of the patient, uh, to protect them from harm. It's for protection of the people that are caring. Uh, for the patient and for uh, any bystanders or folks that might be involved. The, the whole um, point of doing it is to make sure people uh, stay safe and don't get hurt. That's the only reason to do it. Um, restraint is not for uh, punishment. Um, it is not for uh, really any other reason than, uh, than uh, taking care of folks. So it makes sense to continually evaluate our concept of when and why we restrain patients. Pat Lickis. And I think looking at restraint as another treatment technique, and you're approaching the patient's treatment in an anticipatory manner. So just like you would do a 12 lead for a patient having chest pain, the patient was placed on a 5150 for some reason. There was some precipitating factor that brought everybody to that situation. And anticipating the potential outburst by the patient um, even if they don't necessarily seem aggressive or combative at the time, you know, you, you'd probably be wise to anticipate a potential change in their attitude. And when you look at restraint from that standpoint, it's much less of a personal thing, it's much less of a punishment, uh, and it's more of a uh, treatment. If you anticipate a patient trying to ruffle your feathers and get into your skin... Elsie Cuso most likely they won't be successful if you're already prepared for it. And there is something about having that confidence, you know, your affect will be, I'm prepared. So just like your common mugger out there, they're not looking for people who are prepared, they're looking for people who are not prepared and not paying attention. And that's when they know it's going to be easy money. So kind of along those lines, you're going to have somebody who is looking with looking for somebody with a chink in the armor and they'll go straight to it so you just have to be prepared for it and the the manifestation of being in charge in in situations that are potentially violent um, in my experience is the person who has got the most even tone of voice who is calmest and everybody else is out of control you say look this is the way things are going to happen, and they're going to happen this way now. And it's about showing strong confidence. And uh, when everybody else is yelling, if you're the one who whispers, people have to kind of stop to listen. And if you hold your um, body and your facial expression, your hands and your posture in a way that has command presence, um, it has influence on those kinds of things. And oftentimes people will... Uh, comply um, with the, the process of restraint um, more readily if they're being restrained by somebody who's like, hey, look, I got this, and um, and and sends the message of, if you're going to fight, you're going to lose. And there's a lot of us here, and we're going to be kind and nice to you, but we're not we're not going to get beat up. So there's a clear line between being in control of the situation and being rude or abusive. And that's important. And like Mike's saying, getting emotionally hijacked, it's restraint shouldn't be something that you're doing. It's not a personal thing for the patient. Uh, just as it's 
not appropriate, though difficult sometimes, to not take what the patient's doing or saying personally if they do become, if they do have an outburst or, or try to attack. Uh, you know, some of them, it may, it may be a personal thing on their part, but you have to be able to take a step back and really calm yourself and not be the person who escalates that situation. But what about those situations where the patient seems calm? Everything seems calm. But there they are, in the back of the police car, with handcuffs on. They don't seem dangerous. If somebody says he doesn't seem dangerous, that's just one little portion of the whole call. And it's dangerous for anybody, and you wouldn't be a good practitioner of any kind of health care if that's all you look at is one little portion of a whole call. It doesn't matter if it's somebody with a violent outburst or somebody having a heart attack or a stroke or whatever, right? So you got to look at the whole thing. Is there a history of this person acting out? Another big thing is uh, to be able to assess the behavior of your patient. Is that patient anxious or are they at a point where they're defensive now and they're just on the edge of not having all their rationale with them? The obvious acting out person is obvious. And sometimes you're on the other side of that, where you're in that therapeutic calming down period. And, you know, you have to be able to identify these behavior things. And then you'll know what it is that you would go to. And like what Mike was saying, explaining and talking to your patient the whole time is golden. You want to be able to say, this is just for safety. You had an incident of not being able to control some of your your physical things and acting out aggressively. So this is just to to be safe. And I'll tell my patients, I just don't want to get beat up. I don't want you to beat me up. So I'm going to, this is just for safety because you could probably take me. And And the truth is if the patient is unrestrained and they get violent, the actions that you're going to have to take in order to defend yourself are more likely to result in them getting hurt than if they're restrained initially. So it would seem the ethical thing to do would be to restrain a person who is having a behavioral crisis early. But think back on your EMS education. How long did you spend on behavioral emergencies? I think you touch on a great big old gap in EMS training across the board. And um, if not half, I would even venture to say more than half of our patients can present to us with behavioral challenges. And it's not in the curriculum, and it's not in um, any kind of regular training that we have. It's not, for instance, ACLS. We have the whole team leader pit crew thing, right? So we're talking about the pit crew, but how often do we do the pit crew thing versus de-escalating behavioral challenges. I'm going to say we probably do three of the behavioral things to one of the code blues. Much more than Just that. a guess, right? So do we practice? No. Do we learn about this stuff? No. And do we have this uh, integrated training with other agencies since we're going to be playing with them in the sandbox? No, we don't. And to mention at the other end, we have transfer points, like what you were talking about. You know, they have their own game plan at the psych facility. It's going to be different from the the game plan at the hospital, right? Especially if you have all these sheriff's officers there, you know, there's a little bit more intimidation going on for the patient. And then, of course, the, the transfer point from, you know, the first responders, whether it be, um, a police officer to, to us, you know, fire to us. What if we're going to um, a board and care, you know, a, def- a different facility, or we're going to a school, right? I mean, everybody, well, I'm not going to say everybody, but the places that deal with behavioral emergencies every single day, they're a lot more versed at it. 
And quite frankly, we come in as the amateurs and the unpracticed amateurs. It's huge, huge setup for failure. It's huge setup for people to get hurt. It's huge setup for people to get emotionally involved in the interaction. It's a valid point. So how do we start changing the mindset about restraints in the field? Well, when you look at, if you frame restraint as a treatment, it has an indication, it has contraindications, mm-hmm. it has side effects, and it has dosages for all intents and purposes. Mm-hmm. And that could be some verbal judo all the way up to four-point leather restraints with a spit hood. Mm-hmm. Right. And anywhere in between. Yeah, I know we're focused on the restraint thing, but, you know, it's sort of like focusing on one drug that we use in a code, Mm -hmm. right? So there should be a bigger idea of what restraint is. You can verbally restrain somebody. Of course. And, you know, just having control of the situation like what you were saying, and a lot of it has to do with the confidence and your tone of voice and that trust that's built between you and the patient, right? But, um... You know, but just like a med that we're going to push, we're going to talk about Epi, for instance, you know, it seems for the most part benign, and I think a lot of people think that about restraints. It's pretty benign. But, I mean, they have to, they, meaning any practitioner, has to know what the adverse effects are. Well, and the dangers of, you know, mobilizing people face down, the positional right. asphyxia is exactly. pretty well documented, mm-hmm. um, things you want to avoid from that perspective. Um, providers getting bit is fairly common from not thinking about the logistics of right. restraint. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are there are a number of of kind of basic things that um, it's it's easy to remember when you're doing kind of a a live um, scenario practice um, that if people don't have as part of their just default routine. Um, the potential for them to put themselves into a position where they might get hurt is higher. I believe that you know framing this as a, a clinical issue and clinical treatment makes sense, and we're constantly looking at ways we can take better care of patients whose hearts have stopped, whose um, coronary arteries have gotten plugged up, whose uh, neurologic arteries have gotten plugged up, who have been shot in the belly, um, you know, there's a there's a, a plethora of attention um, that is focused on, you know, identifying people who've got infections early so that they can have better outcomes. And um, certainly in the area of behavioral and psychiatric emergencies, um, as Elsie has pointed out, it is a, a huge percentage of the folks we care for. And um, it's also a component of many of the other things that we care for. So people who are um, substance um, under the influence of substances, people who are waking up from seizures, people who are hypoxic, people who are hypoglycemic, people who have brain tumors, um, people who have fungal infections as a complication of AIDS. I mean, there are a whole lot of um, other clinical reasons behind, besides just the purely psychiatric genesis of uh, of behavioral problems that you know the restraint may be part of the. Uh, selection of treatments for. Um, so I think it, it behooves us um, to be um, more expert in how we think about it um, and how we implement it, um, as just, just as we do with all the other um, approaches to caring for the sick and injured and, and folks we care for every day. So I think this is, uh, this is vital and, and it involves daily action and daily decision and um, getting better is, uh, is what we've kind of committed ourselves to do, um, and this is part of that path. You've been listening to the Alameda County EMS Audio Podcast. This is your host, Joshua English. You can download this and past episodes of this podcast on our website at acgov.org forward slash EMS. You can also download our iPhone application, which has access to our county protocols, as well as very important phone numbers to contact our hospitals. Thanks for listening.